Welcome. This is the session on how to build PowerShell. It's VS Code extension or PS Script Analyzer and how to debug things to figure out what the hell is going on here. My name is Christoph Bergmeister. I'll be not just only showing you how to build those tools, but also what helpers are available for doing that. And you can leverage some of those helpers in your binary PowerShell module development as well. So some of the things I'll be showing is Visual Studio Code Spaces, developing inside a Docker container, using Windows Sandbox, and many more things to come. So first of all, before we get started, I would like to say a huge thank you to all the sponsors that jumped in to make this virtual conference still possible. So thank you, Microsoft, System Frontier, Scriptrunner, and the PowerShell.1 website um, by Tobias. A thanks also to the three organizers, Tobias himself, Alexander, and Rob. Thank you very much for making this event possible and that everyone can join for free. I think this is very awesome. So I've already talked a bit about um, what things we're going to look at. So PowerShell itself. Also, it's MSI installer, so it will be quite Windows focused. But what I'll be talking about in 80% of the cases, you can also do on your Mac or Linux environment. In fact, I'll be using tools like, for example, Code Spaces or Remote Container Development that are actually working in a Linux environment. But me actually being on Linux, and on Windows, I mean. So how does it work? Well, we will see. I will show you how to build the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code that you probably use on a daily basis. You might be thinking about extending it, um, so you would want to know how to get your hands on with this uh, extension, which is quite special because it's mixing PowerShell with the modern web world, so we'll see TypeScript uh, and other things. PS Script Analyzer, as I mentioned before, is just a binary PowerShell module but can be used as a prime example of what kind of tricks one can do for building um, and debugging binary modules. Technologies, which I think are the most important ones, you might not be interested in building any of those, but using those technologies could be used in various other areas. So at first we will get started with developing inside a container, and by that I mean a Docker container specifically, and Built on top of this feature is the recently announced preview of Visual Studio Code Spaces um, and the similar product GitHub Code Spaces, but under the hood they are kind of the same thing. Um, some people um, might have seen developers using Visual Studio proper, so not the modern Visual Studio Code that is lightweight and um, you probably see all over the place. No, Visual Studio has still some very enhanced and sophisticated feature that really make an editor worthwhile for some scenarios. Uh, and I want to take the fear away of this big developer-focused uh, editor that is a bit slow and has got some of it advantages and disadvantages. But I want to show you the things where Visual Studio really shines and where sometimes you might want to consider switching to it for a specific task. And most importantly, when things don't work out, we have to debug. So I'll show you how to attach the debugger. Also in difficult scenarios, like for example, when things are just about to start and you don't even have the time for um, attaching the debugger. Okay, without further ado, let's start with PowerShell itself. And since this is not a PowerPoint summit, I'll be switching now over to the demo. So first of all, where is the source code for PowerShell? It's all on GitHub, so we can just na navigate to github.com slash PowerShell, and there we see all the repositories of the PowerShell team. And of course, the first one that is coming up is PowerShell itself. So we can just click on it, and presents, it presents us with a visual view of all the files and folders, displays the readme with a lot of information of how to install it. Some details um, on very 
simple guidelines and around how to developing and getting started. But I want to show you in, in, in an interactive fashion of how developers go ahead about doing it. If you're not familiar with GitHub yet, the first thing that you would do if you want to make changes with a repository is to fork it. In my case, I've already done this and you have might have seen a change in the URL which changes the organization to your personal one. So this is your personal version of PowerShell where you can take this URL or alternatively use the proper URL um, that is a bit easier for Git to use and copy it to the clipboard. And locally, you can just type git clone of this URL and it will download this repository locally. Um, so I do assume that you have some familiarity with Git. Um, if not, have a read, but for the moment, don't worry too much about it. Um, I'll be driving and there won't be too many things specific about Git itself that we will need. So I've already executed this command and it has given me a folder named PowerShell, which is the repo name. So let's cd into this repo. And you see in my shell, there's a couple of Git helpers that show me, for example, the branch and the status. Um, that's just some of the customizations that I have applied. So if you start from scratch and don't know anything, usually you read the re readme, you have a look around the technologies being used. I can tell you it's mainly the .NET SDK that is being used. Um, an indication of it is the global.json file, which shows us the SDK that is being used. And this is something um, that will become quite important um, soon as we start to build it. For the moment, let's assume we know nothing and I will just guide you through of how to do things. So IPMO is just the alias for import module, so we're going to import the build module. If we run a start ps bootstrap, which is the very first command you want to run if you're new to it, um, it's going to basically get you ready. All you need is PowerShell itself for building and developing PowerShell, which is quite nice. In my case, I've run it previously because um, it takes a few minutes because um, it does download you that required.NET SDK and it's telling me we're ready to go. So now if we hit start ps build, this will just build it. And I've already pre-built it, so it's going to be slightly faster than the first time. But it will still take around half a minute. Um, even although I'm, I'm on a four core machine, um, it is reasonably fast. Um, it is still heavy work that it, it is doing. And it's nearly finished. It's showing me where the output is. So in this publish folder, there is the PWS, pwsh.x that we just built right now. So what I could do here is just execute it right away with invoke-item on it. And there we go. So this is our locally built version of PowerShell usually get the indication that it is locally built via this um, git commit ID that is displayed here and it, it's actually matching. So now that we have spun up um, the local version of PowerShell and just to show you there's easier ways instead of having to copy pasting that we could be just running ii of get ps output which does the same thing um, because get ps output essentially just gives out the local path to the build executable. You can also call start dev PowerShell, which is going to start this version in the local console. So because you can have a shell inside a shell, that is possible. You might prefer to use that. Um, it gives a warning about a known issue. Um, as we hit exit here, we'll see an error. There's nothing to worry about. That's sometimes the nature of development. Um, you will see some of those artifacts and sometimes you have to deal with errors and get things into the right state. So don't be too scared if sometimes you see errors. Sometimes 
you need to rebuild. What is important is understanding when an error is an actual error and when it can be ignored. There's no straight answer to that, but it will come over time. So now we know how to build and start this version. How do we debug it? So let's open code. And I've already opened one commandlet here. If we browse the source code in the left hand side, we would usually go to the source folder SRC and have a look at the various projects. So a lot of built-in commandlets are in the commands utility project. Um, and the command that I chose here is the new dash temporary file commandlet because it's quite a simple and easy one. So here is the source code and the source code here is written in C sharp. So I'm assuming some familiarity with a C sharp, but if you're not familiar with it, I think it should be reasonably easy to pick up and you can at least read kind of what is going on. You're probably familiar with the end processing block in PowerShell. In this case, there is no begin processing um, or main processing block. So this is the only block that is being run. And how about we set a breakpoint? So a breakpoint essentially means when the code is passing a line, it should pause and give us, an, give us an opportunity to inspect the code and line by line go over it. As you're probably used to it from the PowerShell ISE or Visual Studio Code, if you use that, when you debug your PowerShell script, the equivalent we can do with the source code of PowerShell itself. If you hover on the left hand pane, this red dot starts to pop up. So if we click on one of those, the red dot starts st sticking to it. If we go back to our shell and bring up this local build version of PowerShell, we can run new dash temporary file and it gives us a new temporary file. So how do we need, do we now make it a hit this breakpoint? Well, first of all, we need to get the process ID there is an automatic variable in PowerShell that gives us this, so 28264, let's remember this for a second. And let's go to the debugging pane here. And it gives us a couple of options. The default one that the PowerShell repo gives is .NET Core Launch, which would do what I've done here locally. It builds it, it gives you this local console. We have already done this. So in this case, we want to attach to it. So if we now hit F5 or just click on start debugging, it's showing us processes to attach to. So let's filter by process name called PWSH. And it shows us also the path to it, and the path gives us the hint already which process ID it is. So this is the second one, and if we hit enter, it's attaching to it. And you briefly saw the breakpoint going away and coming back. If for example, the breakpoint was not fully red, but slightly opaque. It would be an indication that we haven't successfully attached to it. Um, this is usually the case if source and build have gone out of sync. Um, so it should always look for the breakpoint being fully red. Let me try to show you an example when it is not red and we attached to the wrong process. So what if I use this version of PowerShell? You see it's actually not red because we're attaching to my local install install of PowerShell, which is quite different because master has moved on in the meantime. So always make sure your breakpoints are actually red. Let's attach to it again. And now if we run the command again, we now see the console here is blocked. It hasn't returned yet. We're in here and we can actually inspect the state. We can hover over variables. At the moment, they're not defined yet. Um, so common keyboard shortcuts are F10, which means go to the next line. We can step into F11, which means we're going into this should process function. We could step further or Maybe actually there's nothing interesting happening. Let's 
let this function finish and step out. And then we can continue stepping and we can inspect our local variables. We can also do operations. Um, if, for example, this variable was changed and we want to know what the output of path, the vector path is, in a deeper console, we can enter our commands and it gives us the results. We can tag the variables and if it wasn't a string and, and a full object, we could inspect the full object in all its details. And this should give you an indication of what is going on by stepping through the code, inspecting the variables, possibly executing some commands. And that I think is, is very useful. You're probably used to this experience if you were debugging a binary PowerShell commandlet. If not, at the end of the session, when we come to PS Script Analyzer, we'll do exactly this. So the development experience for PowerShell is actually very similar to a binary module. Of course, when it comes to more sophisticated modifications of PowerShell, like for example the parser, you will go a bit, have to go a bit deeper and where you would usually be working in is the SMA project system but management or automation, which is the core project around the engine, the PowerShell compiler, the parser. But for this more um, specific domain knowledge is required, you have to understand a bit of the architecture. There have been a couple of videos around the architecture two years ago from Domgo1 um, around how the parser work and works and the compiler itself. Um, last year at the PowerShell Summit by um, Matthias Jessen, he showed a simple modification as well. So I encourage you to check out those sessions if you want to dive a bit deeper um, into actually mod making modifications to it. So now that we know how to debug it, to build it. What if we build a couple of different things, we install a couple of different SDKs, we probably don't want all the rubbish on our machines and maybe have even conflicting um, environment requirements. A feature that we can use for this, and I will introduce you to this, is developing in a container with the remote development extension in Visual Studio. Um, it is called remote-containers and if you have it set up and I'm going to only briefly walk through it, it basically uh, consists of defining a dev container folder where one defines a docker file which is usually either a PowerShell docker container or the .NET Core SDK and the dev container JSON where you define the extensions you would want to use a command to run after the container has been initialized and various other preferences that you could specify here. There is commands for creating them and there's boilerplate templates. In this case, for this repository, it has already been set up. So I can just click here and have the option to reopen the same folder in a container. Container is spinning up now, we see it here. The very first time it will take quite a while because it's pulling down the image and building the container. Because this container is pre-built, it will be much faster. And we already have a partial instance here spun up and we we type uname, we see it's actually Linux. And um, that is because the default um, Docker container is Linux based and that is kind of the proof that we are actually running within this um, Docker container. So what we can do is what we are used to doing, and let me just demonstrate that, is building from this Docker container, except for one small thing we have to do the first time, and we should be able to build now. And this is now happening again, just in the container. We see here it automatically detects Linux as a runtime, and that allows us to play around in the sandbox essentially and not um, change our global state. We can specify different versions of PowerShell or different modules and that is essentially the advantage of using this rem remote container feature. 
There's of course some overhead involved with it. That's why you see that the build is taking quite a while now. Speeding up a bit more. As I'm recording right now, it's slower than it usually is. And it's going to finish soon as well. So, yes, so how is it working? If we look in this test, you installed it from new, so you have to specify also which extensions you would like to use. The documentation you will find on the VS Code website is quite extensive, but to get started is relatively easy. You install the extension, make sure Docker is running and in Linux mode, and in the settings of Docker, you just need to share the drive on which your Git repository is on. Settings, shared drives, it's just this tick box to allow it to have access to the drive. You will need to give it the credentials the very first time you do that. And this is how easy it can be to set up. Maybe a slightly different way of how you could, for example, build in a different environment. We can also use WSL and just go here. What I'm showing here is I'm going to my local C drive on Windows and I've cloned the partial repo on the, on the top level. The reason being is path limitations. But in WSL, which is Linux based, I can do the same things I can do on Windows if I want to debug something that is specific to Linux whilst I'm still on Windows. So I can do all the building and the running of tests locally here. Using the remote WSL extension, we could even attach to it, but this is a bit more sophisticated as usually we'd be setting up some open SSH remoting for it. And it has built it as well. Awesome. So now that we know how to build and debug PowerShell, we can uh, think about how can we package it up. Um, so there is a command called start ps package. And there is a bit of uh, help in there already on how one can package them up. So if I go to my local terminal, and for a special case of packaging things up, they have to be at the root. So in this case here, um, I had to clone to my C drive, uh, not my usual Git folder. This is just because of path length limitations. And in there, I can use those commands we're familiar with importing the build module. We will be calling start ps build in a sophisticated way. You can specify a release tag, which is the version tag you will see on GitHub, for example. But in our case, we don't really need that. Going to take a bit longer for the local build here because it's doing a clean and it's also doing cross generation, um, which is which is an optimization to make PowerShell run faster. So fast forward, it has built now. So now it comes to packaging, and in the packaging folder there's a couple of modules, mainly the packaging module. It has this command let start ps package. 
So this is going to make us an MSI package and then we're not going to use a release tag. So a requirement for this here is the Wix tools. So Wix stands for Windows Install XML and it's basically a tool that abstracts MSI. If you don't have it installed locally, it would give you a URL where to install it from and it should be as easy as that. takes a while as well. So how are we going to test the MSI? We're going to use a feature called Windows Sandbox. It is available in newer versions of Windows 10. I think it was 18 or 9 or 19 or 3. I can't remember exactly. But if you have a relatively new version of Windows, you should have this feature. And it keeps getting better with each iteration of Windows, so it does, it's definitely worthwhile always staying on the latest version of Windows. And what this gives us is a VM-like environment that we can play with that is very similar to our local environment and the moment we go ahead and close, everything is gone. So you don't need to maintain a VM anymore in VirtualBox or Hyper-V. Um, where the image could go out of date, no, this will be the actual image that you have locally of Windows, which makes it very easy, and you saw it was very fast to spin up. So, the MSI is built in the meantime. So, let's have a look where it is. In that local folder, we see this MSI. So, we're just going to copy-paste it into Windows Sandbox which works reasonably quickly as well, although it's around 100 megabyte. And default parameters were used, and you see there's a couple of hard-coded things, like it's version 6.0 beta 3. That shouldn't worry you, um, because the actual installation path will be still like 7. Um, we could tweak all of that if we wanted to, but just for the purpose of um, having a look at the options that we might want to change or trying to install it ourselves on a different system that is that is enough it's just packaging uh, up the binaries and then after a quick start that should finish relatively quickly and this is how we built and distributed our local version of PowerShell this is not something we would regularly do um, and there is some caution to it, although everything is open source and there is the MIT license. You shouldn't take it lightly to build your own version of PowerShell because it does come with a significant maintenance overhead. This is more for demonstration purposes. And we see we have got this version of PowerShell here locally, quite nicely. And if we exit Windows Sandbox, all of it is gone. So it's a very easy way for us trying things out that you could apply to a lot of different software. Okay, so now that we've gone through different options we can do with the PowerShell repository, let's now build the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code. And because Visual Studio Code is web-based, it's basically an Electron app, um, we're going to need Node.js. You can download it here from this web page. Um, it doesn't matter too much on which version you run. You can use version 10, which I'm using, or version 12. 14 I've never tried, but 12 definitely works. You need Visual Studio Code as well. What I do recommend is to use the insiders version of it, so you can have the two things side by side and also know about currently current things that are going on, as this is for development purposes, which means quite often there's things that would be needed in the preview extension. You can use both, but it's, it's just my recommendation. The code for it is in the VS Code-PowerShell repository, but we actually have a dependency on a different module called PowerShell editor services which is coming up here so what I did before is clone this repository called PowerShell Edge services 
and I've built it locally. And just before I did this session, there was a small breakage in the master build, so that's why I'm on a different branch here to show you actually a, um, a working version. Sometimes you might encounter the latest version on master is broken, so always check the current issues. This is the nature of development, that things are moving fast. Um, you sometimes need to understand those errors. In this case, it was just a simple fix. The PowerShell Editor Services repo is basically a PowerShell module. And what you need for it is to have the PowerShell module um, build module installed. So you would just run install-module invoke build and what you would get is a module called invoke build that has a command called invoke dash build. If you call just invoke dash build, it will run everything, including tests. If you just run the build bit, it will just build it for us. And that's what we, we would do the first time after we have cloned this repository. This repository is for the backend of the extension where the heavy lifting is happening. And sometimes you might need to make modifications to it. Sometimes not. Sometimes it would be just the VS Code dash PowerShell repository. So if we open it in the insiders version of VS Code, and for the development of it, I recommend to have the preview extension installed, not the normal extension, because it will clash once we build it. It is actually quite easy. So if we have Node.js installed um, and we have built PowerShell Editor Services, for which we just need PowerShell itself, if you don't have the required.NET SDK, it will bootstrap it as, as part of it. The only requirement is this invoke uh, build module. Here we can just hit F5 and it will build it. We could have run invoke uh, build build as well. It would have done the same thing. Um, hitting F5 here, which is just a launch task, which we see here. That's the same thing. We can inspect what those tasks do. If we go to the VS Code folder, look at launch JSON, uh, and effectively it's calling a task called build all. There we go, it's coming up now. So this version here is a version with the build version of the extension. You see it's a slightly different color here. So how we can test and debug it. So show you an example. I was thinking of debugging um, the pester stuff that, that is in place here. So if we look at pester tests at PS, the extension works by registering commands, which we see here, run pester tests from file that is being run initially. Um, here, launch tests, if we hit a breakpoint here, no, it doesn't seem to hit. One breakpoint. I think later on, because this is TypeScript, once we start loading the extension, it will hit. So if we open a PowerShell file, change the language mode to PowerShell, um, get a default pester test and save it, the extension should start loading and now the breakpoint is actually read. Okay, so what if we try to run uh, this test here? And remember, it's a pester test, so we have to make sure we give it the tests the PS1 extension. We should see the code lens for it uh, coming up. Coming up here. If we click run tests, we get a debugger in here, and same thing as of commands um, that are being used as before. And so you can inspect your variables and debug your scenarios. 
So this is how we debug the front end. How uh, would, we, would we go about debugging the back end, which is PowerShell Editor Services? Um, I can show you that as well, and I can show you tricks um, for it. So let's first close down this window. And let's navigate to PowerShell Editor Services. In this case, I'm going to use the Visual Studio solution. Um, it will have some advantages, and you will see in a second why. I could have done it using um, VS Code and attached to it via that, via process ID, similar how I did it with PowerShell. Finding the process ID and attaching very early on is sometimes quite hard. So I'm actually going to show you a trick. So I'm going to copy paste this here and I've opened the lens provider. Say if we wanted to hit the breakpoint right when the lens is going to start, we will have some code that is saying if the debugger is attached, break. If it's not attached, launch debugger. So this will allow us to get a window open to attach right now here without having to write some sleep code to give us time to attach to it and possibly output the process ID. And that's where Visual Studio is coming in. And that's why I want to show you Visual Studio. Same thing here, you can click just build a solution once and then you have everything set up to work. I've pasted this code in here, so that means if I go back here, I have made a code change and I see this in my git prompt here. I need to run invoke-build in here, but actually by knowing what happens here, if I press F5, it's going to run the same command uh, that builds it for me. So F5, behind the scenes we see this building PowerShell editor services as well. We go up in the log. It's calling invoke build, build all. The only assumption that is being made between those two repositories is that they are in the same folder. That is something very important when you clone those two repos the very first time. So the extension should now spin up soon. And essentially, what we want is when we open our tests file again, we want to hit the breakpoint as soon as the code starts to load. So we see PowerShell is starting here, so it should, should soon hit the breakpoint. And it did. So a window comes up here and tells us an unhandled exception has occurred. Well, the use an exception as a way of attaching the debugger or sending a notification off. And we can just use our open version of Visual Studio to attach to it automatically. It finds the process ID and does the wiring for us. And there we go. So similar to VS Code, I can use now F10 and my, my usual tools to step over my code, inspect my variables. And something very special with Visual Studio is, say if you want to rewind, you can put your breakpoint up, which I find quite cool. So this is a very cool trick if you want to debug things that start very early on and you want to capture it right at the start. This is a very useful trick, so I'm just going to Remove the breakpoint here, let it continue, and stop the process. And of course, it comes up again, we will just cancel out and close the extension for now. So with that, you know how to debug and run the front end and the back end of the PowerShell extension. If you wanted to give someone um, a build version of the extension, um, you can just run invoke build and I think there is a package command for it that would give you a file, a VSX file, that you could give to someone else to install it locally. If you want to try things out locally, 
in an end-to-end -end scenario, then this might be something you could be looking into. Okay, so the next repository that we're going to take a look at is PS Script Analyzer. It is a repository for which I am the main maintainer. And we're going to use this um, as an example um, for demonstrating Visual Studio code spaces. So I could show you how to clone it, build it all locally, do all the setup. How about we have it set up out of the box? So if you go to online.visualstudio.com and sign in, and it seems I just got signed out. So if you sign in, And if you have an Azure subscription, um, you can just create a new plan. Um, there are a couple of locations, as it is currently in preview. You can choose our subscription. You can choose the plan name. Um, so I'm going to call it something like Hello PSConf. It will give you a resource group name. And creation of the plan is relatively fast. And if you look at plan here and create a code space. And we can just give the code space a name. The git repo here is the git repo where we want to use my fork here. You can actually use in an Azure DevOps repo as well now. It's different instant instance types that um, determine how much you pay for it. Um, I've noticed much of a difference, um, but because I have an MSDN subscription where I get a lot of free credits, I can actually afford to use the premium options. And for saving costs, it will go down after a while. So what this does is very similar to how we saw with PowerShell. There is this remote container uh, feature that we could have leveraged to remote in, into our Docker container and do the development there. It's doing the same setup, except it is being hosted on Azure for us. So that means a bit less maintenance. It also means our laptop has to do much less work. And again, it's um, segregation of environments. And even though it's just a Docker container, we don't end up with lots of containers locally that we need to clean up at some point. Um, within Azure, your internet connection will be much faster. So everything will usually work quite faster anyway. So the very first time, it takes around a minute to set up. The second time, it will be much faster to spin up. And you see here, we will be using a version of VS Code in the browser, but we can actually use it inside the editor as well. I'll be showing that in a minute. The environment is ready, it has cloned it now. You see it looks like a version of VS Code. If we go to the terminal, we see again it's it's Linux based. But this is not an issue. Um, for building PS Script Analyzer, we can use um, the build of PS1 um, script that we have. It's just going to build it for the current version of PowerShell. Um, if we have a look at dependencies, it's again the .NET Core SDK that we're using and all we bootstrap is a module called PlatDPS and Pester. PlatDPS is just for the um, generation of the documentation and Pester obviously for running tests. So what this has done is produced an out folder with the build module. So with that build version I could just import this version. Um, and voila, I can now run my locally built version of script analyzer that I might have modified. 
And how about we try to debug what is going on here? Because maybe we write a new rule. Um, so let's have a look at avoid alias, which is the rule here um, that is being used. And because I've had a look at the code before, if I didn't know, I would always be looking for an instance where it returns a diagnostic record. There's only three instances where it returns it. And this is the one that we will be looking at. So now again, we need to attach to a process. So there's a couple of ways to it. The first one is .NET Core Attach. So we need to take a note of the process ID. And if we search for it here, it's actually easy here in the cloud. There's only one version of PowerShell running. We have it attached now, and if we run the command again, again we hit a breakpoint, we can inspect and debug. Happy days so far, we can attach to it. Something that should be said, um, that is quite important, and I will just demonstrate that by opening a PowerShell file. The PowerShell extension has this integrated console and in that integrated console it already has a version of PS Script Analyzer running so it's never a good idea to develop um, PS Script Analyzer inside that extension because it will conflict. The binary module cannot be unloaded in PowerShell core so that's why you should always be using a vanilla version of the terminal when you're developing the script analyzer. Just some details around it. So this build up PS1 script, there is a all switch, which is going to build all PowerShell versions. This is the version that you would get that you download from the PS gallery. Um, the conversion release would be done for a proper release build. And that is actually what you get at the end of the day. There is, of course, some signing that is happening, but in terms of building, that is pretty much what you get on a PS gallery. If you want to run some tests locally, um, we can just hit dash test. And what it's going to do, it's going to spin up a new PowerShell process. So there's no problem with the, uh, conflicting the current one. And going to run all the pester tests in there, um, which takes around a minute for the whole test suite which is quite good. You can also just run the tests individually. So if I just cancel out and look for the avoid alias tests, what do you use in alias tests of PS1? I can just right click copy path and run invoke pester against it. It's a great way as well to iterate quicker uh, over it. I should say in this special scenario for PS Script Analyzer we have to use this terminal here that is not integrated console. If you have a binary module where you can use the integrated console, um, I've added a menu called run pester tests or deeper pester tests, whatever you prefer. It does all of this for you in the current console where you don't have to do what I did just now calling invoke dash pasture, copying the path to it, it does it for you. It does it also for you here in the Explorer menu. It's the exact same functionality um, to run pasture. Okay, with this I'm going to wrap up. So what we have seen is how to build PowerShell, test it out, debug it, potentially install it in Windows Sandbox, building the VS Code extension attaching to it right when it starts, um, building PS Script Analyzer using Visual Studio Code Spaces. So you have your environment set up to work outside of the box. Out of the box, I mean. Um, so hopefully it has given you some insights. I'd be very delighted to answer any of your questions. Hopefully it was a good overview for you so you get an idea how it would be getting started in one of those repositories or help you develop your um, binary module better with better toolings. So a bit about me. My name is Christoph Bergmeister. I'm a DevOps engineer slash consultant 
at BGSS. Um, we are a global company, we're mainly UK based, but we also have offices in the US. We're always hiring, no matter if you're a developer, tester, a platform engineer like me, um, or just trying to consult uh, businesses, we're very open. I myself am a Microsoft MVP, mainly because of my contributions to PowerShell and the community and some of the talks that I'm giving. Um, one of my hobbies is contributing to PS Script Analyzer, mainly because it helped me in the early days, but also because I find it a quite interesting project in terms of the technology being used. I can use it as a test project for trying out new things, like for example Visual Studio Code Spaces, because it's a real world project that is not too complicated. You can find my profile on LinkedIn or check me out on GitHub or Twitter. And thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to answer any of your questions.